All right, what you see here is the actual screen of the VeriFit. I have the VeriFit driving the projector, so um, you're watching the screen of the VeriFit. And when you turn it on, this is exactly how it will boot up. And um, it takes several minutes to boot up, just like a computer, so you would turn it on before you actually want to engage it, um, just so you don't have to sit there and wait for it and wonder what's taking so long. It's, it's just a couple of minutes, just about as long as it takes to boot up a, a typical computer. All right, so this is the one and only menu on the VeriFit 2, and you see that it's divided in two sections. This is test box. This is everything you can do in the test box, including speech map, real ear measurement, um, plus other types of measurement, like a distortion measurement, um, a battery drain, uh, running response curves, telecoil, things like that, right? Uh, anything you want to do in a test box, you select from here. Anything you're going to do actually on the ear with the probes in the ear, you're going to select from here. And of course, the main thing, and for most people, the only thing that they do other than calibration is the, the speech mapping. So what I'll show you first is the calibration. And you know the calibration on the VeriFit lasts for a week. Okay, if we typically uh, just calibrate it once, it takes only seconds, and then it will let you know when a week has expired, and it'll um, force you to do it again. Even if you never choose it, if you go to run any response and the calibration expired, it will go right into calibration and tell you that you got to calibrate. So I'm going to show you the calibration. Here's the calibration of the test box. Okay, so I just press that, and I get this. Okay, um, and I'm going to click on calibrate over here on the left to do the, the left coupler and then on the right to do the right coupler. I'm taking the two, my, reference these are my two reference mics and I am see, I placing them the right like in that. the middle of the two coupler microphones, the red one and the blue one, yep. without the couplers snapped in place. So the couplers are off and the two microphones are there, directly pointed at and touching, if you want, the very middle of the coupler microphones, all right, left and right. And then when you press calibrate, I'm pressing the left calibrate right now, it will, if you get that, that means you didn't have it close enough or exactly in the middle, a not, not quite good enough location of the reference mic. So I'm going to just press my little check mark here. I'm going to say calibrate again. Now, the reason that failed is because you see this, this artifact that's in there. That artifact would be in every measurement. Now, this is at real high frequencies, but it, it didn't meet the tolerance. Okay? So I repositioned it with that microphone closer. Like I say, I like it touching and right exactly in the middle. And watch the difference now. See, that time it took it, because that's within the tolerance. So this is almost a flat line, okay? Uh, that's because the response of these microphones is just that good. Uh, and now I'll do the right side. I'm glad that happened, because this is, if you've used the old VeriFit, this is more exacting, because it's wideband it's wide now. Okay? There it is. That one was fine. I didn't have to readjust it. But that's the calibration of the, of the test box. Okay, so I right clicked and you see that this one menu comes back and I am going to select speech map. Okay, so I've got speech map selected, It'll come up in a second, and I'm going to mount in here a hearing aid. I'm using an Oticon uh, behind the ear hearing aid simply because it's easiest for me to use. I have a battery in it, a battery pill in it. Um, I'm going to put the coupler on. I snap the coupler, coupler, um, the coupler onto the coupler microphone, just as I showed you how they snap on. And I'm putting the trick adapter on it. In fact, I I'm, I'm, I'm just took it off so I can put my trick adapter on and then snap it on in place. And then I can... Uh, I can actually put on 
one of the hearing aid holders, I just snapped that in place too, um, and then I'll put my hearing aid in the holder, and so I put it in the holder, plug it into the tube I on the on the adapter. It's not a trick adapter because it's a BT adapter. And now it's in place. And, and now I'm, I'm able to make my measurements on it. Moving it up okay. close to the so the actual um, before uh, I start on the hearing I aid like this. And if I need to put in some both, information about the hearing aid. This will be my left view, hearing aid. So I'm going to switch to a view um, then of, of just the, the left side. only rather than the dual view. So you'll be able to see this better. And here I, uh, I'm going to do the measurement in the test box. Now this measurement is exactly the same whether it's in the test box or not. Okay. Um, if it's on the ear, it's exactly the same. By, so by learning one, you'll learn two. Oh, and I notice it's the wrong ear. I'm doing the left ear. So I just right clicked. And here I can change ears from left ear to right ear. So I've selected right left ear, and now it's on left ear. It's test boxes, single view. It's a graph. Um, and um, I, I can do audiometry here. Uh, and here I can s decide what I want my target to be. Now, since I've been using NL2, it stayed at NL2. Right? And since I've been doing adults, it stayed in adults. If I were doing children, you see how I can, uh, I can select the age of the, of the child all the way down to, uh, if I go all the way down here, I'm even down to one month old. Okay? Uh, the University of Western Ontario has normal RECDs, average RECDs for thousands and thousands of kids. That's what makes it... This makes it good because if you were trying to do simulated real ear measurement, you're, you're, you're doing real ear measurement in a coupler, not in the patient's ear, in a coupler. Well, that would be a mortal sin normally because that's not the patient's ear. In fact, it's nothing like the patient's ear. But if you knew the RECD, real ear to coupler difference, you knew the response of the coupler and you knew the response of the patient's real ear, then the machine has all the information that it needs to accurately simulate that patient's ear, even if it's two months old, um, in the coupler. All right? uh, and that's why those averages are good. So, and every pediatric audiologist knows this and, uh, and, and uses this. All right, so how did I do my audiogram? Did I do it with headphones, or did I do it with inserts, or did I do it with sound field? Why is that important? Well, uh, if you were doing a pediatric fitting and you used headphones, the audiogram is wrong. Why is it wrong? The headphones were calibrated in a 6cc coupler. And 6ccs is meant to represent the average area under the, under the uh, cushion of the phone, under the MX41AR cushion. That includes the patient's concha and ear canal. Well, you know, on that three-month-old patient, it's no 6 cc's total volume of concha and ear, eardrum. It's uh, half or quarter or one-fifth or one-sixth of that. Okay, So how can it be right? Well, uh, if you say headphones here, this system will make the correction. Okay, uh, So that's necessary. So all of, that's, all of that's part of it. And if bone conduction was important, you would... You would have bone conduction up there. UCL, we're going to either use the average or we're going to enter it. Same thing with bone conduction. It's either not applicable or we're going to enter the bone conduction audiogram. Uh, of course, with the software, you can bring it right over from the audiometer. RECD, um, we're either going to use the, the average, uh, which we'll do in this case. Uh, and um, here again, you're going to choose, if, if you're using a child, this is the target or the prescription. If you're doing a child, you're going to use DSL child. If you're fitting an adult, you're going to typically use NL1 or NL2. NL1, I say, is good for experienced users. NL2 for beginning users. That's a good rule of thumb to use. Okay, I just chose NL1 here. And I'll use the average UCL and RECD. 
and check, oh, if it's binaural, especially in NL2, say yes for binaural and make sure you got both audiograms in there, okay? All right, now since it doesn't have an audiogram, I'm going to put an audiogram in, and this is the one I think this hearing aid is kind of adjusted to be right for, something like this. Maybe not so much. Something such. There. Okay. Okay, so this is perfect. This is a, the SP allogram that I explained before. This dotted line that you see down here is the um, threshold of normal hearing in SPL. This is an SPL gram. It goes from minus 10 dB SPL to 140 dB SPL. And here is the uh, here's the patient's audiogram converted from HL, which that's the way I put it in, to SPL. Here's the UCLs that were automatically calculated. And I didn't go past 6,000. If I had gone to 8,000, it'd be there and even beyond. Notice that the frequency range goes from uh, 125, right here, to 16,000, right? Okay, so I'm all ready to go here, so I'm going to select my first test. Now, you see I have four curves that I could run. Here's my first curve, so I just turn that one on, and I'm going to choose my stimulus here, okay? And here's the stimulus. I, can, I have two speech stimuli in there. Both of these are... Uh, both of these are designed, one has a male and one has a female speaker, uh, but they are designed to represent the absolute average of North American English speech. Okay, As If you were to average a wide range of people, this is what you would have. So when you're fitting, these should be used. This one is international speech. So uh, I wouldn't, well, some people use that for all the fittings because it sounds kind of cool, but it's especially good, I think, on people from Western Europe um, or Asia. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, um, Eastern Europe or Asia, all right, because it, uh, if you listen to it, you'll see why. Um, here's one that is the absolute average of 35 year old women in North America five-year-old children, live, live speech is useful too, okay? I've got live speech on now, and this is useful for demonstration purposes because you're actually seeing in real time this conversation that I'm having. So you can show a person what's audible in speech and what's not. And you can see that what's not audible for this patient right now is he's certainly not deaf. He has a high frequency loss. These low frequencies are fine. He's just missing this. Here's a good way to show it. If the English language were all vowel sounds, then you wouldn't need a hearing aid, Mr. Jones, because you hear those fine. Ooh, ah, ee. But there are also consonant sounds, not just vowel sounds, like this. Now, of course, I have, I have the hearing aid in place now. So that's, here, I'm going to take the hearing aid out. I should have showed it to you with it out. Now, ooh, ah, e. All right, now watch the. Here's the high frequencies that he's not seeing. I had the hearing aid in, and I'm saying, "Boy, this is this is pretty good." Right? And of course, with the hearing aid in, it should be pretty good. But without the hearing aid, barely audible. Not aud not audible at all. Okay, so he misses those. This is without the hearing aid. Now I'm putting the hearing aid in place. I just snapped the coupler on the uh, 
coupler onto the coupler microphone, and now things will be different. Okay, so um, let's run the first curve. So I'm not using um, I'm not using the live voice anymore. Instead, I am going to use one of the calibrated signals. Live voice is good for demonstration, calibrated signals for actually fitting. And I'm going to start off at 55 dB soft speech and just see how that does. There's my target. And right now, speech is playing inside this box at 55 dB. And I, at this point, while it's playing live, is when you would be adjusting the output um, with the fitting software. And I'm watching the LTAS curve, that center curve, and I'm seeing how that looks relative to my targets, these little plus signs right here. Okay. And when that's hovering close to those, then I'm going to hit record, and then it will record 12 seconds, long-term average speech spectrum. And the center should fall on or close to those targets. Okay. So if I think I'm okay, and actually I think I should be adjusting the highs a little bit more, but I don't have the adjustment software. I'm just showing you. Uh, I would adjust it if I wanted to. And then when I thought I had it just about right, I would hit this red record button, and then I'd be quiet for 12 seconds while it averages that. Now, would I be happy with this? Absolutely, I would. Okay, um, Because, look, I'm basically on target up to and including 2,000 hertz, and I'm at just a couple of dB below target at 2 and 4. If I was really fussy and anal about this, I might adjust those two. Uh, and, you know, I'm just, I'm just I'm hitting the target uh, even for uh, 6,000 here. So I'm pretty happy with that, and that's for soft speech, right? Uh, and and I I even have this this bar graph. This bar graph shows you the speech intelligibility index. 70 is considered very very good on this, and I've got 77, and that's for soft speech. So I'm pretty happy with that, right? Unaided, I had a score of 56. Okay? 70, 80 is great. Uh, something below that you try to try to do better now if i wanted to see the unaided speech banana i could do that now i see that i've taken my l test look at this all this high frequency is not audible and i've boosted it way up here and made it audible for him okay uh, so that's good that's good for counseling purposes and then if if i wanted to see i could just show the l test long long-term average speech spectrum, or show nothing, uh, or show the whole, the whole thing. Okay. So now I'm going to do another curve, but this time I'm going to do average level speech rather than soft speech. So I choose this one. See, it's a different color. See, the target is higher now, and I'm using the same signal, which is it's a female voice, but it's one of those absolute average of North American English. And um, at this point, while it's running live, I would be, I of course, have my programming cable connected, and I'd have my programming software up, and I would be adjusting so that uh, I'm hovering pretty close to uh, the targets. And when I thought I had it adjusted pretty good, then I would hit the average key. I could stop it by hitting this anytime I want. All right, not bad. I am falling a little bit short of target uh, in the high frequencies of three, four, and, uh, and 6,000. All right. So uh, I probably would, maybe not so much at six, 
but at three and four, I'd probably want to just bump it up a notch or two to meet target. Uh, but I'd, I'd be essentially pretty happy with this. But I could see where I could do a little better. Right? Uh, now, the third one, you could do loud speech now. And you'd have a third target for loud speech. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do MPO to show you how that works. Here. And this is very commonly people do. So it's at 90 dB. So it's going to do, it's doing 90 dB burst now. And here's, here's the results. And this is just sweeping through, doing 90 dB burst at one third octaves. And I'm not exactly crazy about this. And the reason I'm not crazy about it is because you see how close I'm coming to these black stars. The stars are the uncomfortable loudness level. When this patient goes into a noisy environment, they're going to think this is too loud, unwearable in there. Uh, so what I'd want to do now is I'd want to go to the fitting software, to the maximum output controls, uh, and I'd want, to, I'd want to bring down the maximum output of this, right, without affecting the soft speech and average speech. Okay, so I'd, I'd, I'd want to adjust that. When I had it adjusted, I'd do that same thing. I'd hit this red record button, and it will run it once and, and record it, and plot it, like that, okay? So this is typically what I would either print out or save, depending on how I intended to do it. So, and this would be the same if you, if you were doing both hearing aids side by side and you wanted to view this one along with the other one or even run them together in a test box, uh, binaurally, then I would just simply have this in the dual view rather than the, the single view. I, I have it in a single view just so we could see it better. Um, and if, if I was running the other ear, I would right click to get this menu back. I'd go to the right ear. Um, and this screen would look the same. Here I'm choosing the other ear. Right click, back to the left here. This screen will look the same whether it's in actual real ear measurement or if it is um, in running in the test box. The procedure, everything is exactly the same. You've just learned how to do speech mapping either on the ear or, or in the test box with this. So I want to show you some other things. Okay, This, I think, should be pretty clear. I hope it is. Uh, and you can certainly see the advantage of it. I right click to get this back and I just want to show you a couple of a couple of things that are cool that you can do in the test box that are very useful. Okay. Um, one thing is I'll just start down here and kind of go up. Uh, what if we just want to get response curves on the hearing aid? Okay. Uh, well, that's that's very easy to do. I, I'm choosing my first one and I can choose what signal I want to use, whether it's just a sweep or it's, it's and I could choose my input, 60 dB, that's good, and save it. So there's just a response curve, and I could, it could either be gain or it could be SPL. I like to just do gain. Now, what really good is that? Well, I kind of know the response of the hearing aid. This isn't on the ear, this is just in the coupler. This is the kind of data that the manufacturer publishes in brochures and in catalogs. And, um, um, and that looks good. I see it rolls off in the high frequencies and things. But now I want to see what the hearing aid does as far as its compression goes. So what would happen if the input level was 70 instead of, uh, instead of 60? I expect the gain to go down like that. OK, excellent. The input level goes up and the gain goes down. The unit has compression. What if, I'm going to run a third one, what if the input to the hearing aid was 80? We're now in a loud place. I expect the gain to go down once the hearing aid recognizes that, and it sure did, right? Compression. You just saw the attack time. <laughs> uh, okay, what if it was 90? Again, I expect the gain to decrease. There it goes. So now I've verified that.
that this hearing aid has good compression. Here, this is, this is the gain of the hearing aid with a 60 dB input, something kind of close to conversational speech. Then a 70, kind of loud speech. 80, loud environmental. 90, very loud environmental noise. And the hearing aid handled that by decreasing the gain when there's more input and increasing the gain when there's less input. We'd call that indirectly proportional, right? Which is what compression is supposed to be. So that's a nice test to do in a test box. Let me show you something else that would be nice to do. I love this, battery drain. Now some hearing aids, are just, the case is designed so that you can't measure battery drain because you can't get a battery pill in there. But this has battery drain and for the hearing aids like the one that I'm using, which is a uh, Oticon, <coughs> excuse me, you can get the, uh, you, you can get the uh, battery pill in there. So I'm going to start the test now. You select on here what kind of battery it is. This is a number 13 zinc air battery. And how many hours a day is the patient going <coughs> to wear the hearing aid? Okay. And, um, and now I'm just going to start the test. And I'm, I'm just going to be quiet during this test, and I'll explain the results to you after it measures it. Whoops, this is telling me how to do it, okay? In case I didn't know how I was supposed to set it up. You do this with an ANSI coupler. Um, ah, I am not in an ANSI coupler. Okay, well, let's say I, I have my broadband coupler on. But you would do it with, I'm going to leave it, but you would do it with the ANSI coupler on to be exact, okay? To, to be measuring the same thing the manufacturer did. Okay, so here's, that's, that's how long it took. It's measuring how much current is being drawn by the battery under three very different conditions. First condition is quiescent. Quiescent is an engineering term that means no signal being processed. In other words, quiet, right? Nothing's being processed by the hearing aid. Because the hearing aid is a digital signal processor. Um, and then... 1,000 hertz is 65 dB, which represents conversational speech levels. And then loud sounds. This is 90 dB, also 1,000 hertz. Anyway, three different. Quiet, 60 dB, I'm sorry, 65 dB, and then 90 dB. Okay, how much current is being drawn? And um, the only number that the manufacturer gives you is the center one, right? And here's the actual number, 1.34 milliamps okay and that's about right for a, a relatively low gain hearing aid like this you expect it around 1.2 1.3 and then for the middle mid like like say you had a more severe loss you'd expect it to get up to 1.5 1.6 and then if you had a real power aid they approach uh, 2 milliamps okay at 65 dB but you also know how well the regulation is uh, suppose drawing quiescent, you had a low bar, and then drawing average speech levels, you had a bar like this, say, and then at loud, loud noises, this thing went off the chart, you know, and that would be poor current regulation over a range of different levels of input, okay? Today's digital hearing aids, if I had this in the, in the, in the ANSI coupler, they'd all be exactly the same, and they're real close to the same as 1.20, 1 1.27, 1.34, they're, they're almost the same anyway, but I bet you if I had it in a proper coupler, uh, they'd be exactly the same, and the level would be, I know just by looking at it, that it's appropriate. Uh, but people that come to you saying it's eating batteries, you expect that to be uh, much higher than is appropriate for that hearing aid or for there to be poor regulation. Suppose the guy says, hey, um, it started eating batteries since I started working at the factory and the loud level was off the chart, okay? Now you would know that because of poor regulation, which uh, in, the, in the hearing aid, uh, it's eating batteries when he's at the factory wearing it. <laughs> uh, and that would be something the manufacturer would have to fix. Old hearing aids you might find are just like that. So maybe he needs a new one that has better current regulation. 
Okay. Uh, what's another good test to do? That was battery drain. How about distortion? Okay. What does this hearing aid do? Again, this should be done in that blue coupler, all right, the standard ANSI couplers. Um, but what does the hearing aid do? Somebody is complaining about fidelity. It just doesn't sound clean, all right? You listen to it, it might sound fine. So now you want to really do uh, a very specific exacting test throughout the frequency range of speech, okay? So here we go. This is with a 65 dB input. I'm going to be measuring total harmonic distortion at one-third octaves from 250 through 4,000 hertz, the range of speech. Okay, here we go. Look at that. Cheers to Otacon, all right? And this is what we expect from today's digital hearing aids. At conversational levels, we expect zero total harmonic distortion, okay? So this would be a graph, and the graph is at zero. There isn't any, okay? But then your patient says to you, oh, wait a minute, this thing sounds fine when I'm sitting in quiet talking to you at normal voices, normal conversational level. But when I go to the office, everybody's yelling. And they're yelling because they're getting their voice over all the background noise. Copy machines going, air conditioners running, other people are talking in the background, uh, maybe other machines running in the factory, whatever. So let's run it again. But this time, instead of a conversational level of 65 dB, let's run it at 80 dB. Now everybody is shouting. Now's when he says, now it's not clear. Okay, well, let's see. Test over. I went up to 80 dB where I'm almost saturating <coughs> the input microphone. And look at this. The most distortion I had is at 1250 of 1%. And this is, this is when you have a very, very this is a, an Oticon Agile. When you have a very, very high quality digital product, this is what you expect to get. And this shows you it is as clean as it could possibly be. Okay. Uh, now, of course, you might have a mountain of distortion somewhere. You could even have that on a new hearing aid, a brand new hearing aid. Uh, and the manufacturer tested it and missed it because he only checks distortion at um, two or three frequencies. And, and, and it actually occurred in between those or in another range of the hearing aid. And the patient noticed it uh, uh, and they missed it. Well, you're not going to miss it on this because it has, it, it, uh, it has um, all those test frequencies in it. Right? So that's a, that's a good test of fidelity okay, under different conditions. Let's see what else we have that's really useful. Distortion. Oh, we just did that. Um, what about noise reduction? Some hearing aids are meant to reduce noise. Um, I'm going to go to the single view. And... Um, and sometimes that's very important. You have a, a student who is sitting in a classroom. He's sitting up front. You, you want him to be able to look right at and receive information from a teacher standing in front of him and not hear the noise that's in the back. Okay? So a directional test would be good. Also, a distortion test uh, would be good. Uh, and a noise reduction feature would be good. Does this hearing aid to have the ability to reduce noise, okay? We'll, we'll check out everything that this patient needs. Uh, what about a situation like this, a different situation? You are wearing your hearing aids that have digital noise reduction feature on it, and uh, you are meeting your friend at an airport, okay? And uh, you're having a conversation in a lounge uh, of the airport hotel. 
And then the guy comes along and starts vacuuming the floor while you're having your conversation. Okay, another vacuum cleaner, about 80 dB. Uh, so let's see what would happen. Would the noise reduction kick in? I'm starting test. Now there's the vacuum cleaner. That solid line was when that vacuum cleaner first started running. Now look at this. This is the output of the hearing aid now that the vacuum cleaner has been running. It's realized that that's not speech and it's reducing it. especially in the lower frequencies here. Okay. Uh, now, some hearing aids have more than others, but you'd expect it to do something. If both of these curves were superimposed, then there was no difference. Uh, it it didn't, didn't do any active noise reduction with that type of noise, and there's several different noises to choose from. All right, I'm back to my menu just by right-clicking. And what about directionality? Okay. Uh, I hear the, back to the student, uh, I'm trying to give him an optimal situation. So I want him to have good fidelity, optimal fidelity, which I check with distortion. I want him to have optimal noise reduction, best signals to noise ratio. And I also want him to have a directional microphone. So he hears from the front where the teacher is and it reduces sounds, excuse me, from the back. So going back to um, single view and I'm going to see what happens here. There is a uh, conversation happening here inside the box with the hearing aid in place. And I, I'm going to move the hearing aid slightly just to find a sweet spot. There it is. All right, here's, here's what I found. This, this, in the hearing aid box, test box, it applies speech from the front and this noise in the back. And what is the front to back ratio? We should see this thick curve here. This one is uh, the signal that's coming from the front and there's a different signal coming from the back. The system can distinguish those. And you notice that it has a difference between a signal coming from the front and the back. It's supposed to have a directional microphone. So there's supposed to be a appreciable dis difference between front and rear. Okay? Uh, and this hearing aid's doing a great job with that. Okay? Uh, if these two curves were superimposed, then there's no difference between uh, how the hearing aid is processing signals that are in front of the patient and signals that are in back of the patient. Some hearing aids use two microphones in order to do this. One directed at the rear, which um, actually picks up noise from the back, so that that's part of the system that's being analyzed, um, processed, and picks up sounds from the front, knows the difference. And it attenuates the ones in the back, and of course it processes properly the ones in the front two microphones are being used to get the optimal results. Well, what if those two microphones were miswired? In other words, the one that's supposed to be hit, picking up sound from the rear now is actually wired into the circuit as if it was the one in the front. Well, this has actually happened. And uh, when we saw this happen, it was a practice here in Atlanta, uh, the the thin curve here was actually the one that was higher and the thick curve was lower. So I thought, well, we've got that in there wrong. You know? So right away, I, went, I, I pressed help. I See, I could push my help button if I'm on a particular test and it will show you how you're supposed to have it positioned. Right? I thought, did I have it positioned correctly? Well, I do. Uh, so it wasn't that I had it positioned wrong. Uh, so when I made sure everything was right, and I ran it again, again, I can't believe that. It's backwards. It's, it's actually processing at a higher level, more amplification, 
from the rear than the front. So this student is actually hearing the, the kids and the rustling paper and the noise and chatter or whatever's going on in the back of him more than he's hearing the teacher in the front. It was miswired, sent back to the factory, miswired. Now, how would you know that unless you ran this test? But certainly, that would not be optimal performance of that feature for that patient. And how would you know it's even working uh, unless you had some kind of device like this to verify that that feature is working? So when features are important for patients, especially important, like directional microphones, fidelity of the instrument, uh, noise reduction circuits, things like that to optimize the uh, the effect of, of the hearing aid, the, the performance of the hearing aid, the performance of the patient in different situations, you'd be able to uh, actually test those things and demonstrate that they work. Okay, so what we've seen is the main things on here. These are the features that people use the most. Speech map, and it does the same thing on the ears in the test box. So what you saw works the same way. Directional, uh, the... Uh, you saw the directional test just now. Noise reduction, you saw that with the vacuum cleaner. Manual control is on there because the academics want it. You know how to calibrate. Uh, this linear and AGC, I'm not going to demonstrate that because we're running out of time. But uh, this is if you wanted to run the, the hearing aid battery. Uh, this does a battery of tests including uh, gain, gain curves and, and, and distortion and... and uh, a measurement of uh, equivalent input noise, etc. The the same as hearing aid analyzers have always do the 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 ANSI battery of tests. Uh, that's used in universities uh, and maybe in in VA hospitals and, and other places where they have a set uh, procedure and standard. But it's seldom used by by um, typical clinics today, simply because they uh, they just don't want to take the time to do it and the, the, the measurements that we just made are the most practical ones. Distortion, very good for cases of fidelity. Input output curves, you can run those too, um, but I don't even know anybody that does. I would do better running my multi-curve function. That's where I was able to actually show a gain curve at different input levels and verify not only that the hearing aid has the proper frequency response, but also that it, the compression is actively working. And, of course, battery drain for people especially who complain about a hearing aid eating batteries. So that ends the demonstration of this. I just wanted to show you one more thing. This is the Real Ear Measurement Probe module. And you notice, I talked about this um, in the beginning, you notice that um, each one of the probes actually has a nice place to, to sit. When you're doing the calibration of the probes, um, people who are used to Verifits know this, but all you do is you take the tube that you would be putting in the patient's ear, you will be putting it in the patient's ear, and you'll be getting it in there far enough that it's past the end of the hearing aid. That's the important thing. Um, and then put the hearing aid, tube goes in first, hearing aid goes right on top of it. And, um, and when it's being calibrated, there are little prongs here so that that tube can bend over and the end of it sits on top of what's called a reference microphone. And, uh, and then you do the calibration, just like we showed. Uh, it's, in fact, Ken could probably come over here. I hold it away from this speaker, and I hit calibrate. And, uh, uh, and I don't know, about six inches. It's not that important, the distance, but it's relatively close. And just hit calibrate, and in two seconds, it's calibrated. That's the, you'll do that for left and right, and that's, that calibration lasts for a week. Okay. Um, th this is, uh, I, there was a couple of things about real ear measurement, right? It's if on, on, my, on my menu, I'm choosing real ear over on this side, which means actually on the ear. We just looked at the real ear probe module and the probes themselves. We talked about putting the tube in the ear far enough. That's the big thing. People who use it for the first time, they've never done this before, they don't have the probe the tube in the ear far enough, right? So they make a bogus measurement. It has to be in there far enough where it's beyond wherever the end of the hearing aid is, no matter what that end is, even if it's a coupler in the a receiver in the canal that has a dome on it. Just the end of the tube has to be past that. 
People that once with a little bit of practice, you just throw it on anybody. Uh, okay, so here's the screen. This is just a single view. And um, I just wanted to show you a couple of things about it. Uh, and here's, here's one thing. Let me, let me show you the calibration of it while we're at it. Uh, this calibration is already done, but I'm choosing calibration here. And I'll do the left. I'm just holding it six inches from it's the not that outside important in the distance. Speaker, but it's relatively <laughs> calibrate. And just Oops. hit calibrate and in two seconds to calibrate. All right, when you get that, that Who means used that to you don't notice, have it exactly but all you do enough is you take the, the tube that you would Same be putting in the patient's ear. It is more critical. You'll notice you'll be getting it in, the getting it in the there before, far enough that it's more critical. the end of the hearing aid. That's the important thing. it was before because... Um, and then put the, the hearing aid... I'm holding the probe. This is both... You do it separately for the left and right. I'm holding it approximately. doesn't matter exactly. It's not, it's not, that not important worth measuring. Distance, Six inches relatively from close. this external and calibrate and in two seconds and I'm hitting calibrate. I have the tube between the posts so that the end of the tube is sitting on top of the reference microphone. If it gives you a uh, an error, just move it up a little bit. Uh, it's pretty exacting because of the wide band. But once you get used to it, you do it within seconds. Okay. Now, on speech map, when you're actually doing it on the ear, you'll see this screen. It looks exactly like the screen we saw when we were doing simulated really me measurement in the test box. Um, there is one big difference, okay? And here's what the big difference is. For the type of hearing aid, here's all the different types of hearing aids. And um, this doesn't make much difference, except that it adjusts the, the algorithm to account for the differences in microphone positions with these different types of hearing aid. Notice that one of them is open. That's not even there when you're doing it in the test box because you shouldn't be doing simulated real ear measurement on open fits in the test box. You should be doing it on the patient's ear. Uh, but when you choose open, this is an open fit, and I would only use open when it is truly open. And open means that there is amplified sound that's leaking out of the ear because it's a truly open fit. It's not sealed in the ear. You might have a receiver in the ear. That's okay. Uh, uh, this, this is a, a, a BTE hearing aid with a thin tube and then the receiver in the ear. But the important thing and the only thing to worry about in this is, is it an open fit or not an open fit to this system simply means amplified sound leaking out of the ear because there's no seal in the ear, okay? When that happens, that amplified sound that's leaking out, where does it go? It goes right to that reference microphone that controls the output of the system. These things are regulated systems. If the patient was to be sitting right in front of it, and get up and walk to the back of the room, it would actually know that, and it would get louder to make 55 or 65 dB back there in the back of the room. If the patient came closer to it, it would decrease to make 55 or 60 dB right up close to the unit. You see what I mean? It's regulated. But if amplified sound is leaking out of the ear and going right to the regular mic regulator microphone, then the regulator microphone is saying to the rest of the system, wait, this is too loud. Turn it down. And everything is bogus. Every last thing is bogus. So if it is an open fit, or if you think it's an open fit, choose open fit because here's what happens. Okay? You put the patient in the position, and the best philosophy for this is have the patient sit as close as possible to the back part of the unit as is comfortable best signal to noise ratio there. It's not critical, but have them sit in place and be comfortable and say, we're going to stay in this place for the rest of this test. Okay. So he's there. Then when you start, uh, the calibration has expired. <laughs> the calib that's just what happens when the calibration has expired on a particular, you know, if you've gone for over a week and you haven't calibrated that. So it pops up like this, and I'm holding it in position and letting it calibrate.
okay that's fine now it hasn't expired and I can run it so that was good that that happened because it shows you what happens automatically you don't even have to worry about calibration when it expires it will make you do it okay all right but notice this when I went to start running a curve the first thing it did is say equalize so at this point I have the patient in position the position he's going to stay in and I push this and now the measurement takes place normally and I can adjust this and use ladder intensities carrots are grown all over the world in gardens and, and wild this is my this is my target is now of course I have no hearing aid and I'm not even in the ear but this is a great place to show to what's not being heard what's missing and what is and being heard this is all being heard because this is audible this part of speech that's below the patient's threshold is not being heard okay. at this point I'd be adjusting the hearing aid and if I had the tube in the ear hearing aid in place uh, and and running and I was making my measurement now with loud this happens to be loud speech just so you can hear it uh, then I should be meeting this target and that means that this part of speech needs to be adjusted up so it's hovering pretty close to these targets and then once it is once you have that done with your fitting software is when you push this then it starts an average okay now of course if this was a test result I'd say boy I'm not getting any amplification at all which of course I'm not because there's no hearing aid I'm not using a hearing aid at the moment doing it without but you see this part of speech is audible this is the part that's not the high frequencies consonant sounds what makes the patient say you're mumbling because that's missing okay so I just wanted to show you that you see that's the difference between open fit where it had to do that equalization at that moment when you hit equalize it calibrated the patient in place and then it shut off that reference microphone it's no longer in play it's no longer a regulated system it's simply a calibrated system that calibration takes a fraction of one second um, and but that's the difference it does not operate as a regulated system when you're in open fit it does a calibration within a fraction of a second and then it just goes and the regulation the regulator microphone is shut off for the remainder of the measurement that's so now if it's leaking sound out of the ear it, it's it's getting right to the reference microphone but the reference microphone is shut off so we don't have a bogus, bogus measurement that's the one thing I wanted to show you um, and the, the only thing left that I didn't mention is uh, real ear to coupler measurement how to use real ear to coupler measurement uh, if we were doing that I can even access it from this screen you see here we're doing this says W R E C D W is simply for wide band but we would go to that um, I would put in here what I used did I use headphones or whatever that makes a difference and then I would be continuing with the test it already knows the response of the coupler and has it here and I would be uh, I would put the tube in the ear I would put the uh, I would be using the real ear to coupler uh, real ear coupler difference the RECD transducer right there's a place where that would plug into the system uh, in fact it plugs right into the module uh, the probe module and I would put a foam tip at the end of that put that in right on top of the tube which is in the ear and I'd measure the response of the ear uh, and uh, it's something that if if you're not going to make a good RECD measurement then use the average right if you want to be more exact and actually measure the RECD and it's it's really important when you're doing simulated real ear measurement otherwise don't worry about RECD but if you're doing a sim simulated real ear measurement in the test box of a child well you select their age and it'll use the appropriate RECD if you actually want to measure it instead just make sure your measurement is good it takes just a little bit of practice to do and then you can do it every single time and you have to have a patient that will be quiet enough pa pediatric patient usually uh, quiet enough and still enough to let you measure this it only takes a second it's not as long as you would have them sitting there if you were programming the hearing aids 
Um, so on some patients you can get it and some patients you can't. And if you can't get a good one, then it's not worth getting. It's better off to use the average. Okay. Uh, all right. Well, I hope that's been helpful to you. Um, and you see this screen for, um, here, I'll, I'll go to single view so we can see it better. Here's the response of the coupler. You'd be measuring a response in the ear. And when you do that, you'd be getting another curve down here. And the difference would be this. And this, is, this dotted line is the typical difference, really the coupler difference, on an adult. All right. So if we did mine, it should end up very close to this. If, if it was way down here or way up here, I'd say it's bogus. It's wrong. I know that by looking at it. Uh, on a child, we'll have a curve that runs about parallel to this but above it because um, they have a, a smaller ear canal. But if I have something that, that doesn't look right, then I don't want to use it. I'd rather use the average. Okay? All right, that's the last thing I say about it. I hope this has helped you with the new VeriFit 2 um, as far as in-service training on it. It'll just take a little bit of practice, and I hope you see the advantage of this instrument and the improvement over, over the original.